Welcome to the Brothers in Crime podcast. We are brothers. We talk about true crime. We don't take ourselves too seriously. And you shouldn't either. Imagine your 14-year-old little sister is missing. It's been two days since she was last seen. Your family gathers around the television to watch the 5 o'clock news, wondering if there are any updates in your sister's case. Instead, the news reports that two bodies have been found, each shot execution style in the back of the head, and then the broadcast identifies the victims. One of them is your sister. The case we're talking about in this episode is the second of four double homicides that took place in relatively close proximity in less than three years, commonly referred to as the Colonial Parkway murders. You don't have to go back and listen to the previous episode for this one to make sense. Just know that when we make reference to Kathy and Becky, we're referring to the first double homicide victims of the Colonial Parkway murders who were featured in the last show, episode four. September 1987 at the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge in Isle of Wight County, Virginia. This area is about a half an hour drive southeast of the portion of the Colonial Parkway where Kathy Thomas and Becky Dowski's bodies were found. It sits on the south side of the James River Bridge, which is a very long bridge that spans the James River in that area. And this parking lot was known as a drug deal and high crime area. It was poorly lit at night. And the area surrounding the parking lot has these deep marshy swamps that lead down into the James River. David Nobling was 20 years old at the time that he was murdered. He grew up around cars and racing. His stepfather, Carl, who had raised David from the time he was a little over a year old, was really into both of those things. He liked working on cars. He liked going to the racetrack and racing. And so David and his little brother, Michael, spent a lot of time with their dad in the garage and at the racetrack. David particularly really just liked turning a wrench and spending time getting his hands dirty, working on cars. The Nobling family lived in Newport News, Virginia. David's mom and stepfather had separated when David was 11, but his stepfather, Carl, had still been, he called him dad and had remained a part of his life. And as you'll hear later in the story, is a part of his life all the way to the end. David's mother, Judy, had sent David to a private military boarding school near Martinsville, Virginia, so a little bit of a hike from where they lived. After a year, David transferred to Frederick Military Academy in Portsmouth, Virginia, which was much closer to the family. Unfortunately, not long after he transferred back, the school shut down, and David attended a public high school for his senior year. He didn't graduate, but he went out, and instead he got his GED, and he made it a point to do that pretty quickly. His brother Michael recalled that he always seemed like a cool dude and he really looked up to him. And one of the things he noted is David had these, quote, huge biceps. His brother has often said he just was everything that he wanted to be as a little kid. When David was getting close to being an adult and needed some wheels to get around once he could drive, he went out on his own and he bought a brand new 1986 black Ford Ranger. That's a pickup truck if you're unfamiliar. And he absolutely loved this truck. It was his pride and joy. Everybody in his family said this truck was like the most important thing in his life. He and his brother had installed an aftermarket radio in it, and they had wired it so that the radio could play even with the truck turned off. His favorite bands included Pink Floyd, Kansas, Rush, ACDC, Marshall Tucker, and Charlie Daniels. Wow. Hit a chord with you over there? That's quite the spread. <laughs> Yeah, so he was well-balanced. I think I, I can respect that. I appreciate that. And as far as leaving school, I can imagine if you've been to public school, you've been to two military academies, and then senior year, you go back to public school. That was quite a difference in culture. Yeah, it's a big change. And his mom said that when she initially sent him to the military school, it wasn't so much a punishment, but she was really just trying to set him on the right path. He had some trouble in school, and she was sort of at her wit's end and didn't really know what else to do. And initially, he really hated military school, but within a month or two, he fell into the groove and figured it out, and then he really started to thrive. And she said she was really happy with her decision to do that, and that he, in the long run, really got a lot out of it and started to excel in school. So I can imagine losing that that kind of routine, the regimen, and the discipline. Look, there's nothing wrong with the GED. Speaking as a high school dropout with a master's degree, I can say that and represent. That's right. Sometimes it's the quickest way to the destination. There's multiple ways to get to the same spot for sure. And David, that seems to be him. From what I've read, he sounds like he was a motivated guy. This was a point where I don't think there was quite the emphasis on education that there is today. And so even to take the steps to go out on his own and to get his GED, I think that says a lot about who he was and the fact that he was a determined individual. He was interested in finding out who his birth father was. And so he learned the name of his birth father, and he made it a point not only to just find out who it was and to meet him, but then he wanted to spend time with him. 
He hid this from his mom and the rest of his family, who was not part of his biological dad's family. Um, But he would actually go over and spend time with his biological father and the kids that his biological father had and had really plugged in there to try to build a relationship. David was dating a girl named Tara. At the beginning of September of 1987, she told David that she was pregnant with his child. She was 16 at the time, sensing just the magnitude of that. They started having conversations about getting married and what the future might look like for them as a couple. Tara said that David smoked cigarettes, he drank alcohol, and he smoked pot. She's quoted as saying he didn't live a perfect life, but he did live. He was genuine, kind, funny, and loving. And so I think that just helps to paint a picture of who he was, the things that were important to him, and what he was looking at in life and where he was at the time that this all went down. It sounds like the dude had some initiative and go, okay, so he smoked, he drank, and he smoked weed. He's 20 years old. Yeah, there's nothing in here about him killing anybody. So it sounds to me like he's sort of typical-ish, a work hard, play hard kind of 20-year-old. That was the vibe I got. Yeah, that doesn't make him a, a bad human, just makes him a human. Yeah, for sure. Where Tara or Tara said that he was genuine, kind, funny, and loving. It seems like in all the interviews that have been conducted and the things that have been said, a lot of people had these stories about, yeah, he did something nice for somebody or he went out of his way to help someone or made it a point to put a smile on somebody's face. It seems like that's just kind of the personality he had. Now, Robin Edwards, she'd been born in Lexington Park, Maryland, and she was named after her grandmother. Robin's mother said that Robin was feisty even as a young child. She described Robin as very independent and noted that when she was little, she would climb onto counters. She would scale swing sets to hang upside down from the top. She was that kid who would pull out the drawers and do whatever she had to do to climb up to get the cookie out of the cookie jar. Her mom said she was just fearless. The Edwards family lived in Newport News as well, and they had moved there after Robin's father retired from the Navy. Robin babysat the neighbor's boys. She rode her bike. She loved to swim, and she really enjoyed drawing. She wanted to be an artist when she grew up. She loved to listen to Def Leppard and Michael Jackson, and her favorite movie was Dirty Dancing. She started smoking when she was 12 years old, and her dad uh, smoked too. And so this was something that, interestingly enough, they did together, which might be more frowned upon today, but certainly back at that point in time, I don't think that's totally outrageous. But it also just goes to show that she really had this strong bond with her dad. She looked up to him, and she wanted to be like him. And the reverse was true, too. He really doted on her and cared about her a lot. And there's a story that's been shared about how her father was called into school one day to bring her different clothes because she was wearing something that the administration had deemed too revealing. So he went in planning to just have a conversation and and anticipating what this would be like. And on his way in, he saw another student, another female student, who he says was wearing something far more revealing than what Robin had wore that day. And so he goes in and essentially just choose the administration, a new one, for wasting his time to bring these clothes down when there are other students who are dressed less appropriately under their standards than what his daughter was. And so he really stood up for her, cared about her a lot. It was clear that that was his little girl. Good for him. And I have to say that we should not think ill of Robin for that anecdote, because I'm sure in the mid 80s, what a school administration would consider revealing would (laughs) be considered highly conservative today. (laughs) Right, for sure. No, that's a great point. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what she's wearing, but that's a good point. I'm glad you made it. And certainly those times were different. And I think this says a lot about her dad to be that forward thinking and to just care about his daughter that much. She had made plans at one point to literally run off with the circus. Oh, wow. And another story that her family's told that they say to this day still makes them laugh. And frankly, it made me laugh pretty hard. She got a pure white kitten at one point and really wanted to name it Cocaine. But when the name didn't fly with the fam, she said, okay, how about Coke? And they said no. And she said, all right, we'll just call it Classic. So the cat's name was Classic, which I assume is a reference to Classic Coke, Coca-Cola. But everybody knew what it really meant. Exactly. Those are some stories that just really show you the kind of personality that Robin had. Now, in May of 1987, Robin ran away and she was gone for eight days. While she was away, there had been a newspaper story where her family was pleading for her to come home. And when she saw this, it really touched her heart and she felt bad and she felt like her family cared so much it was important for her to go back. So she returned home. But after this, there was an incident where she actually pulled a knife on her mom. Oh, yeah. And so that was not great. And her mom took her to a juvenile detention center. In amongst this time at juvie and then 
getting some treatment and some medications and some diagnoses where they realized maybe Robin had some things going on, things got a lot better. Her family said she was basically like a totally different person in terms of some of this anger and these issues that she was having. That September, Robin started the eighth grade at Huntington Middle School. And while she was there, she accepted an invitation from a boy to go out on a date. And that boy, Jason, was David Nobling's cousin. And that is how Robin and David's paths end up colliding. I get the similarities. I get how they could be fast friends. They both sound like they want to do their own thing and not be boxed into something. That's true. And Robin's mom has said that she frequently hung out with older kids and older teenagers, even adults. She always just wanted to hang out with the older crowd. So yeah, I think you're right. I think there was probably some magnetism there in terms of just the way that they saw the world and the way they lived their lives. So David and Robin, they didn't know each other until September 19th. David drove his cousin and Robin for their date and David's little brother, Michael, tagged along. Now remember, he's driving a Ford Ranger. There's only really room in his truck for one person to ride up front and two people to ride in the back. Back me up here. So Jason and Robin are the ones that are on the date. David's just driving them. Yep. And Michael is the little brother just tagging along. He's just tagging along. Probably, you know, the way I see it, it's probably so David has somebody to hang out with and talk to while this date's going on. So he's not just like the third wheel sitting around with nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The third wheel. So now it's more like a group thing. Right. So he's got his brother. He's got somebody to talk to. That's kind of the way I imagine in my mind. So uh, on the 19th of September, this crew, they head out to the movies. They're planning to go see Dragnet, but so was everybody else. The movie was sold out. So they went to an arcade instead. For those of you who don't know, you want to explain what an arcade is? (laughs) Yeah, they don't exist anymore. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you can't find them now. So back in the day when your only video game option was an Atari and not everybody had those, if you wanted to play... Frogger. Yeah, Pac-Man. That was my game there. This Pac-Man for sure. (laughs) There was a place, a building. They'd be in strip malls. They'd be in regular malls downtown or whatever and it was just video machines the large video machines lined up side by side and oh so you just go there and play them for free right oh no you had quarters they took quarters or they took tokens depending on the place you were in you just stood there and played video games and your high score was something to protect because anybody else that came in and played that game could beat you and put their initials in all you had was initials on there anyway thank you for younger listeners who might not know what an arcade is all right so Now, according to David's brother, Michael, Jason and Robin hung out together while he and his brother hung out at the arcade. It was misty and rainy that night, and this rain persisted for the next few days. It was just awful weather. But because of the misty rain and the fact that David was driving this little little pickup truck, people had to ride in the bed. So Jason and Michael, being chivalrous, they rode in the bed while Robin sat in the front because she's the lady. Or in this case, she's the girl, because let's not forget, she's 14 years old at this point. So the young lady is riding up front with David in his truck. Now, according to Michael, the ride in the truck was the only time during the evening that Robin and David had spent together. Other than that, they weren't together at all. It was Michael hanging out with his brother. It was Jason hanging out with his date. They're all playing at the arcade, having a good time. Robin had an 11 p.m. curfew, and she made it home in time to call her mom at work and let her know that she had made it back. She watched TV with her little sister until about half hour after midnight. Her little sister remembers watching TV with her and then going to bed. Now, after dropping Robin off at her house, Michael, remember this is David's little brother, says they dropped off their cousin Jason, and then they went back home. So Michael and David go home, it's just them, and Ms. Nobling ordered pizza for her and the boys, and they watched some TV together while they ate dinner. Around midnight, David said he was going out alone this time. Nobody asked where he was going, because remember, this dude's 20 years old. He's got a job. He's living his life. As he's leaving, Michael, his little brother, did ask him if he could bum a cigarette. And David gave him a cigarette, and then Michael sat and smoked it as he watched his brother drive away for the last time. Now, around five in the morning, Robin's dad wakes up and discovers that her bed is empty. So he calls Robin's mother, who had no idea where she was. Okay, maybe she's run off again because this has been an issue in the past. They were still concerned. They were worried. But they have it in their mind that she has run away before, but we thought we had all that fixed. Yeah. So, all right, we just got to find her. I imagine as parents, you're upset, you're nervous, you're worried. But with that background, you're probably thinking, we've been through this before. We got to go find her. 
So Robin's mom went to the police station when she got off work, but they wouldn't let her file a report because they said not enough time had passed. And you got to think, this is the 80s. And frankly, police weren't as worried about missing kids and runaways back then. We didn't have Amber Alerts and they didn't take things as seriously as they do now. So in this case, they sent her away and said, come back when more time has passed. She'll probably be home. We'll talk to you later if she isn't. Yeah. If she doesn't turn up Mm. tonight, let us know. Basically, right. Now, the Noblings didn't notice until later in the day. It was normal for David to be out, whatever, and partying, having fun with his friends, doing things, whatever 20-year-olds do. So it wasn't until later that afternoon that his mother became worried. And as time passed, then she became very concerned because although he would have a tendency maybe here and there to stay out with some friends and then come home a little later in the morning, it was very unusual for him not to call or to turn up by the afternoon. So she was just very upset about it. A sheriff's deputy on nighttime patrol found an empty black Ford Ranger parked with the keys in the ignition, the doors unlocked, the driver's side window down in this misty, rainy weather, Uh and the radio playing. Some reports indicate that one or both of the doors to the truck were open. Some say that they were shut. Either way, it appears that there's this truck in an area where vehicles should not be unattended and left that way. And the Daily Press reported that two pair of underwear and two pair of shoes were found in the truck in the cab as well, along with David's wallet. Now, police didn't immediately realize this could be a crime scene. So they called David's mother and they say, hey, you know, there's this truck and you need to come get it. And she is immediately concerned. She says, wait a second, my son, his truck, that's like the most valuable thing in his life. There's no way he would leave it like that. Something is wrong. But the police, they're like, just come get this truck. Now, Tara, David's girlfriend, said that while he knew the area, that was not a place that they would go. Interestingly enough, she said that there was a church parking lot that backed up to some quiet, secluded space that was where he liked to take her on their intimate occasions. Even though David's family knew the abandoned truck was a red flag, his mother said, police just said, you got to come get this truck. And so her ex-husband, Carl Nobling, who David considered his dad, he went and got the truck and brought it back. Was the truck found in the area that you described as like the drug dealing area? Yeah, that's right. So it's in this little parking area that maybe could fit five, six, seven cars by this bridge. It's dark. There's trees. It's not well lit. And David's family is very much feeling like the police are not taking this seriously or as seriously as they should, particularly once Carl comes and gets the truck and sees how it's been left. He just knows that this is not right. And mom is telling you just straight out the gate, there is no way that he would have left this truck like that. Something is wrong. Yeah, they said if if David was going into 7-Eleven to get a pack of cigarettes or something, he was locking his truck. He's the guy that's parking it off on the side so it's not getting door banged and backing it in. It was his prized possession. And so Carl, David's stepfather, he went out looking for David and his waiters. He went and got his waiters and he's in this marshy area in this preserve. And he just felt like the police were just not doing what they needed to be doing. And he jumped in and my heart goes out because you would think we need to do everything we can. And then if you feel like the people who should be doing something aren't doing anything, how much more you're going to go out there and you're going to try to figure it out yourself. Now, police were able in this sort of early on period to confirm that Robin had been in the truck because her mother identified one of the pair of shoes that was in the cab of the truck. Remember, we had two shoes, two pair of underwear. The way that they were able to identify these shoes, they were unique. Um, There were a pair of white Keds, like the canvas type shoes, and she had drawn and maybe wrote some things and had some artwork on them in marker or whatever. And the police are able, they've talked to some people to figure out, you know, who and where and what and when. And through that, okay, Robin's name comes up that she had, they had been out on this thing. And then it was, okay, maybe these little shoes that are girl shoes, because we got three guys and a girl, are they hers? And so her mom's able to say, yeah, definitively, those are Robin's shoes, but staying in line with where we are in the story. At this point, police are like, okay, well, maybe there's something, but they're just not as into it as Carl would like them to be. It's raining. According to his brother, Michael, it rained for three or four days straight right around this time period. So between the tide, the rain, the weather, it's just, it's making it very difficult to conduct a good solid search. Thinking and hoping, I'm sure, that Robin had run away again, her family recorded an interview with a local news anchor, and it was supposed to air on the evening news that Wednesday evening on TV. They had been successful with that previously. Previously. They put out their plea, Robin, come home. And And it worked. Right, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm sure for them, they're like, we hope this works again. So Wednesday afternoon, the search is still on. A random jogger came to Ragged Island and he parked his car and he just went for a jog in this area where they're searching for missing people. 
during his run, at one point, he turns around and he hightails it back. He's like really running now. <laughs> Shortly before four o'clock on Wednesday, he saw what he thought was a pile of clothes, but it turned out to be Robin Edwards. He reportedly did not touch anything and immediately ran and found a police officer and told them what he had seen. When this happens, Carl Nobling is out at the refuge, still looking for David. He's there. He's committed. Carl had been arguing with the police to allow him to look for his son once this discovery was made. And they had sort of been, you know, no, you can't go down there. No, no, we can't let you. We let the random jogger go running around, but we've got to keep you from going. Ultimately, the police relented. And sadly, it was Carl who actually found David's body. Oh. He was stuck in some tree roots, bloated from being in the water for those couple of days. But Carl knew that it was David and it was. Coming back to the beginning of this story, the Edwards family is sitting around watching the TV, waiting for their interview to play, and they're hoping for Robin to come home just like she had before. The Noblings were also sitting around their TV, waiting for updates to find out what happened to David. But none of them were prepared for what the news reported, that two bodies had been found, they'd been shot execution style, that they were dead. And not only did they report this at the breaking news hour, but they also showed images from the scene and they confirmed that it was David Nobling and Robin Edwards. That's horrible. David's little brother, Michael, said that he watched his mom's blood just drain from her body and she screamed and made noises that he frankly never wants to hear again. I can't even imagine. And it wasn't just them. David's girlfriend, Tara, who was pregnant at the time, found out this way, too. When they found the bodies, Robin had on a blouse and pants, and according to some accounts, she had her bra, but it wasn't on tight or wasn't on correctly. It had come up was around her neck. Some people say it was in the truck. Some people say it was still on her. David only had pants on when their bodies were recovered, and as the news reported, they had both been shot. David had been shot not only in the back of the head, but also had been shot through and through in the shoulder, and Robin had only been shot once in the back of the head. According to Danny Plott of the Virginia State Police and the Colonial Parkway Murder Task Force, it was clear that Robin had been sodomized or had anal sex. Their belief was that she was raped. There's no details on why exactly they believe this, and again, this is an ongoing investigation, so maybe that something that they're not willing to release for whatever reason. I should point out this particular case was investigated by the Virginia State Police, not by the FBI, because it didn't occur on federal lands. It occurred in the state of Virginia. Also, the Virginia State Police officer, Danny Plott, noted that the three days that Robin spent in the water had contaminated the DNA. Now, the medical examiner at one point said that Robin had sex before she was killed, and the surviving sperm sample was able to be extracted from her remains. But as far as we know, nothing has come from the DNA testing. I think it's worth noting, though, that in 1987, DNA testing was not anything like what it is today. Given the amount of the sample size that would have been required back then, I don't know. I have no knowledge, but I wonder what's left, if anything, or if they've used up the samples to try to test under the old technology. Because it's an unsolved case, it's an active case, there's a lot of information, those kind of details that we don't have and we shouldn't. That's okay. That could be extremely revealing. Sure. If the offender's DNA is recorded somewhere, it could point you right to the offender. Or mm -hmm. if it's David's DNA, then you can rule that out. You can rule out that motive, most likely. Right. Yeah, it tells you something about what happened, for sure. Now, David's autopsy apparently also showed that he had beans in his stomach, which is relevant because he had eaten pizza for dinner with his family. So investigators have theorized that maybe he and Robin went to Wendy's and had chili, or maybe they went to Taco Bell after he picked her up from her house. But again, that's just a theory based on the fact that he had that in his stomach. David's family has focused a lot of attention on his truck, noting that it was his pride and joy. They believe that the killer staged the truck. Particularly compelling is the detail about the car stereo. Michael, as I mentioned earlier, had helped David install this Pioneer head unit, this upgraded, nice stereo. And when they did it, remember, they're gearheads. They've been around cars their whole life. And so they wired it so that it would work without even turning the key to the accessory position, which is where the key was turned in the truck. So... Michael, his brother, has often thought that the person who committed this crime was trying to make it seem like maybe they were sitting there listening to the radio and had the key turn the accessory position, not realizing that even with the truck off, you could still turn the radio on, which right. David obviously would have known that. David would have known that you didn't have to turn it to accessory to listen to the radio. That causes the family to wonder how much of that scene was staged. And you got to wonder, too, was that where they even were? Were they somewhere else? And then the killer drove the truck to this place. And then this is where he sets it up to look like that's where they are. 
did the murder take place somewhere else? And because the police didn't initially seize the truck, but instead they had Carl come get it and take it and park it at, I forget exactly where, he went and parked it somewhere. And then after this, they realized, oh, yeah, it turns out that is a crime scene. So they processed it after the fact. Then you've got the delay and the possibility that people who are not involved have now touched the truck or been in the truck or whatever. It- yeah, they could have smudged off fingerprints that might have been there or whatever. Yeah. There's something that stood out to me after talking about Kathy Thomas and right. Becky Dowski from last week is how the driver's window was halfway down and the wallet was still in the mm. truck. Because I, I remember Kathy's wallet being open face down on the floor of her car yeah because at the end of the day whether you're going somewhere for intimate activities whether you're just out on a date with your friend or your girlfriend or your, your whatever or you're joyriding or whatever you're doing or you're going to go do drugs none of those activities require you to get your wallet out open it up and then leave it on the dash or the floor yeah there's plenty of people that don't carry their wallet in their pocket a lot of people carry their wallet in a pocket or a purse or something but to have it open face down that was weird so here you're saying the window is part way down the wallet is separated from david and it's not that his wallet couldn't be separated but again you usually have it tucked in a compartment or something but why would the window be halfway down this misty night maybe they were he could have been smoking we know he's a smoker but it makes me wonder if there's not someone that is presenting themselves as law enforcement or some kind of authority to get them compliant i just wonder no, that's and that's a theory that has strung the cases together, and it's a theory that makes a lot of sense, frankly, because you think a law enforcement official kind of rolls up on your scene there. I'm sure that's going to catch you off guard and make you a little nervous. I just wonder if that could have been the premise upon which a suspect was able to get these people out of the car sure. and under control. Yeah, and in a dark place like this, how hard would it be to put a blue light or red light or whatever, throw it on your dash real quick, and then you've got the bright mag light flashlight with 7,000 lumens and you're pointing in somebody's face and they can't, you know, there's something there for sure. Now, the fact that uh, Robin and David were shot and shot the way they were, I I don't know exactly what that means, but it's an interesting detail. And then their bodies turn up in the water. So how did they get there? Because of the weather conditions, maybe the slow start with the investigation. I don't know how much has been done to try to determine exactly where maybe they entered versus where they were recovered. But given that just that area with the marsh, it's clear forensic countermeasure to get the bodies in this water. And we heard from one of the medical examiners that had an impact on the DNA that they tried to recover from Robin. The gunshot wounds, has there been any mention of how far away or how close those shots were? I didn't see anything because, again, at least I have not been able to find like an autopsy. The reason I ask is because my first thought is the shot in David's shoulder was a miss. So mm-hmm. that was shot number one and then shot number two was to the head. But if these are point blank or they're within a foot and there's tattooing or something would prove that, then the miss theory doesn't make sense. One of the investigators theorized that David was running away and got clipped in the shoulder and probably fell down, whatever. And then the killer came up and shot him in the head. His family really takes issue with that theory. And particularly his mom say he wasn't a coward. He wasn't the kind of guy who would just run away. They see it as perhaps maybe he was trying to protect Robin and maybe try to jump in the way or something like that. And that's how he got shot in the shoulder. The if- running away, getting shot in the shoulder and falling doesn't make any sense to me because in my experience, Experience with people who have been shot non-fatally, many don't really realize what's going on even. It's not like the movies where it knocks people over and spins them around and all that kind of stuff. For the most part, many people have said what they notice about being shot is they feel like warm water somewhere mm. on the outside of their body and then they realize that it's blood running. This is a young, healthy yeah. guy that's physical. It wouldn't spin him around. Maybe he is running with Robin, trying to get her out of there. That would not be cowardly at all. He gets shot in the shoulder. He's go oh, crap, better stop. But I don't even see that because it sounds like this guy had street sense. And if you're running from someone and they hit you in the shoulder, then by golly, you just going to run faster take a turn and get the heck out of there but yeah i'm with you it doesn't make sense and the shoulder shot that was a through and through they didn't recover the bullet they say that they know that the projectile was larger than a 22 but from everything i've seen they've never identified exactly what size what caliber was used and i don't know maybe they know and they're just keeping that detail to themselves but larger than a 22 that's like everything <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, well, what does that rule out? Back then, you know, you're probably looking at what, 38 special, maybe a 357, nine millimeter, I guess. Um, you know, I thought about, well, okay, what if the killer, he's pointing a gun at him and maybe David tries to make his move. But even then, I think, like you said, David's young, he's a fit dude. He's charging and gets shot in the shoulder. You know, along with what you said, that's not going to stop him. And he's probably going to just continue and he would have more gunshot wounds or more injuries or something to the front. Whereas we just have the shoulder through and through. And then we have the one that killed him to the back of the head, which is exactly what happened to Robin. And then again, we come back to motive. So what's the motive? Is this somebody who is impersonating law enforcement, just looking for the right people to attack? And when I say the right people, what I mean by that is just circumstantially who's in the place where that person is comfortable committing that crime. I don't mean that Robin and David did anything to warrant it. I just mean this is his hunting ground and anyone that's yeah. in there when he has the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. David and Robin were shot in the back of the heads and Kathy and Becky were strangled and then cut. You know, I've tried really hard to nail down because I have also seen that's been reported. There's some question about whether they were just strangled in such a way that it actually lacerated their throats or in terms of what actually killed them. Was it the strangulation or was it that they were strangled, unconscious, but alive and then had their throat slits and that's what killed them. So there's been some conflicting stories on that, depending on which source you look at. Sure. But again, you know, without having the autopsies, there's a little bit of a conjecture to all of this for us. I think you said there wasn't any evidence, at least in the case of Kathy, mm -hmm. that based on the blood evidence, they believe that she was already deceased by the time her throat had been cut because there wasn't the bubbling kind of spatter. Correct. Expected if Kathy was still breathing at that time. Yeah. And that was based on the crime scene photos. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. What I was meant about that is that you have a different mechanism, a different weapon there. So you have strangulation, right. ligature strangulation and or slitting of the throat. And then with this one, you have the gunshot. When we talked about Kathy and Becky, we did question, was the offender really this inept? Because mm -hmm. it seemed like you have the two different methods of killing, but it looked like he tried to push the car and it got stuck and it looked like he tried to set the car on fire with diesel fuel. And so I remember we questioned, is this person an idiot? Did they learn from that? And then now, what is it, almost a year later? Yeah, we are just shy of a year. Kathy and Becky, that occurred in October 86. And then this is in September of 87. You know, I mentioned that his family talked about all these particularities that David just, there were certain things particularly related to his truck. And one of those things was he backed his truck in wherever he went. But when his truck was discovered at the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge, it was not backed in, it was pulled in, which kind of lends itself to this idea that perhaps that scene was staged or, you know, was the truck used in some way or was the truck then driven to where it was left rather than uh, wherever David and Robin had been at the time that they had right, this did, person come upon them. Is that where the offender found them? What goes against that is, like the family said, that he always backed in, this was pulled in. Not not to mention the issue with the radio being on and it being in the accessory position. And it doesn't sound like he would have left this truck of his with doors open. And even if he was had the window halfway down smoking, it doesn't sound like he would have left the truck and walked away from it that way willingly. But the other side of this is that if the truck was moved there and they were transported in that truck, it's out in the rain and law enforcement says, we'll just come get it and take it home. By the time the police started to process it, it, it had been out in the rain for a couple days or whatever. Yeah. This case has been unsolved for 35 years. It's a lot to take in. And his family, her family, they're still just waiting for answers. You know, again, I just think there's a lot of people who were around back then that are still around. Uh, if you know anything, if you think you know anything, if you know somebody who you think might know something, these cases need to get solved. Anything that anybody can do to see that happen, we need to do it. 30 some years is a long time to not have justice, to not know what happened. And for whoever did this to be out there having their mm -hmm. free old life and a clear name and somebody knows something, damn it. That's it right. It's just going to take that one person who has been sitting on a secret or who has been sitting on something that they didn't think really mm -hmm. made a difference to make a phone call, to send an email. That's and right. If whoever it is out there that doesn't want to talk to law enforcement, reach out to Bill Thomas. Mm -hmm. He's collecting every piece of information that anybody's willing to share.
Yeah. One last thing that uh, just dawned on me. We've got underwear and shoes in the cab of the truck, but then we've got Robin and David dressed. David doesn't have a shirt on, but for a guy in the 80s, that's pretty standard. They've got some clothes on where they're found in the water, but these other things are left back. And I just think about logistically, you hurry up and you get dressed maybe, but wouldn't you probably still put your under? I mean, I just, I have questions. And then if you're out of the truck, if you're out of the truck walking around, you'd think you probably would put shoes on. Or if you didn't, what would be the reason for that? So I think those clues are telling about maybe how some of this went down or maybe the condition, what was going on when. But if it's a rainy, misty, soggy, mid-September night, I can't imagine that they would want to be out of the truck barefoot. I mean, that's my point. Yeah, I agree. Different situation. If it were dry and warm, I can see people... Yeah, going for a little walk. Maybe they're trying to find their way down to the river or they're just putting their toes in the grass. Right. They could have gone for a swim. They could be doing things outdoors that there's more room than inside of a single cab truck. But the fact that the weather sucks makes it sound like they were not out of the truck voluntarily. Yeah, something was not the way that it ought to be. The murder of David and Robin was the second of four double homicides that took place in relatively close proximity in less than three years, commonly referred to as the Colonial Parkway murders. In the next episode, we'll explore the disappearance and presumed murder of Keith and Sandy, the third case of the Colonial Parkway murders. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us on the Brothers in Crime podcast. Feedback and suggestions are always welcome. For links and resources related to this episode, please see the show notes or visit us at brothersincrimepodcast.com. We hope you'll save, subscribe, or bookmark us on your favorite podcast site and join us for the next episode. And then there's like a rooster that's like... I think that's great. Honestly, I like it.